We're pleased to have with us today Rania Abu Zaid. Um, she's based in uh, Lebanon, and um, many of us have read her work on Syria. Um, she's been reporting, though, on the Middle East and South Asia for 15 years. Um, now working as a freelance journalist. Um, she's won several awards for her Syria coverage. Um, she is one of the few reporters that has uh, been inside Syria um, th throughout the conflict. <laughs> and I think your last visit inside Syria was in, in August, is that? Yeah, late August. Late August. So um, since the uprising began in 2011 until almost uh, Presently, she's been working inside Syria, so we're delighted to have you with us here in the U.S. Um, in Washington, and to to be able to benefit from your insights into Syria. Um, I think that there could be two strands of discussion with with Rania. One, of course, is about um, the challenges of covering violent conflict, and um, what that takes as a person, as a journalist. Um, but then there's the other part of, of what's happening inside Syria. Uh, there was recently an interview with Rania by Jadalia. It's a, it's a very good interview, and it's about the issue of covering uh, conflict, uh, media, women, and, and uh, coverage. So I'm going to let that stand as one, uh, one opportunity for people to, to learn about um, the challenges of, of uh, reporting on <coughs> Syria um, and and use this time really to focus on trying to get a handle on what's happening inside the country. Um, and I want to start off with um, a discussion, a little bit of a discussion about s sort of the trajectory of, of the conflict. Originally, Syria uh, started off as a this popular revolt. Um, around the time of, of Egypt and Tunisia, you were covering both places. Um, and so there was, of course, this triumph of, of um, you know, people rising up against an authoritarian regime. And then there was the armed insurgency. Um, and now what we're seeing is a multi-front um, battle, a very complicated one with different armed actors, uh, continued regime activity. And um, I just ask you, Rania, to maybe reflect a bit on what you witnessed in, in terms of the conflict's transformations and sort of some of the benchmarks for you in that process. It's a big question. Yeah, it is. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the invitation to New America Foundation. Um, as you mentioned, I uh, covered uh, the uprising in Tunisia and then in Egypt. And it was in late February 2011, my editor asked me if I wanted to go to Benghazi, which at the time had just opened up. And I um, told them that I wanted to go to Damascus and see how this state was reacting, if at all, to the changes that were happening in the region. I uh, was in Damascus in late February 2011, and I saw the first sort of rumblings of discontent in the capital. And they were ca small candlelit vigils. And they were in solidarity with the Libyan people. They had nothing to do with uh, requesting the fall of the regime or anything like that. And you know, I saw how the regime reacted to them, how its various security forces were out in great force trying to um, intimidate. And uh, th these very small gatherings, there were only about 200 people, the first one, in Damascus. And from then, things started to uh, progress. You know, I remember walking in um, nighttime demonstrations in the uh, areas around Damascus and how there was a, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a liveliness, a cadence, a, uh, there was an energy to the, Syrian, uh, to the Syrian protests that I hadn't seen in Tunis or in Egypt. They were, um, there was this uh, incredible energy and, uh, you know, the chants, it was in the chants, they were very musical, the, uh, the, the cadence would sort of shift with the chants and I remember that when I was walking with those demonstrators, very few of them flinched when the bullets started to fly in those early days. I remember that clearly. There were men, women, children out in force on the streets. That was the early days. Very different picture now. But it's very interesting to, to think that they were steadfast so early on. 
Um, I think it was clear from the beginning that it was going to be existential for both sides. I remember speaking to some of the people who were out in the streets in those early days, and they uh, said, listen, you know, we c when we leave our homes, we know that this is it. If we don't continue in our path, we may be hunted down. They knew from the beginning that this was going to be existential on both sides, and the regime from the beginning was also. I mean, this was a fight for survival for, survival for both elements. And so then when it turned into an armed rebellion, it probably wasn't surprising, um, given the violence that the regime used against the demonstrators and the determination and, and the feeling of it's all or nothing, in a sense. In the, when it, f it started to militarize in the uh, summer of 2011, and um, there was a town in the north, a town called Jisr al-Shagur, and that's where we saw the first real sort of uh, organized pushback. And they were civilians at the time, the people of the town who um, fought back, basically, and they attacked the uh, security and military installations in their town. This was a town that also had a long history with the regime back in the 80s, along with Hama. There was a, a bit of an Islamist sort of uh, uprising in this town, and it was crushed. So the people who, who took part were the sons, the grandsons of the people who remember what happened in Jisr al-Shur in the 80s. But uh, after that, that was, that was the civilian side. But for the most part, they were defectors. And I remember being with uh, some of the earliest groups of defectors, and um, they were adamant that they didn't want armed civilians with them at the time. They wanted it to remain. They, they wanted to, to maintain some form of military um, discipline, if you like, and they, they didn't want civilians to join them. But after a while, as the killing continued, as the bloodshed continued, they started actively requesting civilians, uh, civilian assistance, and that request was made you know, over mosque loudspeakers. It was made in amateur clips um, uploaded to YouTube, and we started to see you know, more and more uh, people take arms, and in the beginning they were just uh, locals. Uh, they, they formed what was called a Katiba battalion, although it didn't cor correlate to the military definition of the word. Um, they were basically, you know, a guy, his cousins, his sons, his neighbors, local men who, who, who formed these groups. And with time, some of these battalions started to coalesce into larger groups. And they started to coalesce around geography or around ideology, in some cases both. And, and then we started to see the um, multiple groups acting and we're still fighting for the regime. And when did it turn into what we think now is a battle between armed groups? Uh, you know, they, they um, let me, s let me step, so back a, a step back a second. In the uh, summer of 2011, uh, the so-called Free Syrian Army was announced. The formation of this group was announced. It was a group of defectors who announced this. Um, it was never an army in any sort of you know, organized sense. There was never any command and control. And this is something that I and many people have stressed in our reports. It was just sort of a loose franchise outfit, an umbrella term under which these groups could uh, organize without being seen to be um, m unregulated militias, if you like. Uh, so, you know, people started to identify themselves as Free Syrian Army. Um, there were other groups as well, even from the very beginning, who were outside of this umbrella term. Um, and they tended to have a more stridently Islamist uh, ideology, although there were groups within the, that identified themselves as Free Syrian Army who were also Islamist by nature. That's a very broad term. I just want to say it's a very broad term. There's an entire spectrum within Islamism, so they're not all the same. I want to stress that. Um, so we started to see other groups as well forming. In uh, January 2012, we saw a group called Jabhat al-Nusra, which announced its presence inside Syria. It's also widely known now that it is an Al-Qaeda affiliate, but it didn't announce its presence until January 2012. And even from the early days, when uh, after Jabhat al-Nusra announced its presence, there were groups within the armed Syrian opposition who made it clear that they didn't agree with its ideology. They uh, didn't agree with, with, uh, with uh, the type of Syria that this group wanted, but that they needed them. And I often heard that from many fighting men. They, they would say, listen, you know, we don't, we don't uh, agree with the kind of Syria that these guys want, but we need them now. Because they, th these were the men who came and said, you know, not only will we support you, but we will support you by fighting and bleeding and dying with you. 
which is more than any sort of assistance that they got from other groups, other people, other sides. So, you know, th they were never sort of uh, united. It wasn't as if they were they were united, but it was a, a, like a marriage of convenience, if you like, for many for many uh, people. Not for all. Many of them warmly <coughs> welcomed them. They agreed with their ideology, and they appreciated the assistance. But the uh, the fighting, like all of this, came out into the open more than a year ago. Actually, it's um, you know it's become deeper now over the last, I'd say, six months. But it's been more than a year. Um, and it was the, the, the rivalry was played out um, on low-level sort of things, like the assassination of a particular commander. Um, one group would overrun the checkpoint of another. There were these small sort of things that we would see. And um, with the declaration of uh, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem, which was another Al-Qaeda affiliate. It uh, identified itself as um, Jabhat al-Nusra's parent organization in April of this year. When that came to the fore, that's when we really started to see the, um, the very intense intra-rebel rivalry. And uh, so you, were, you witnessed this firsthand. Um, is it, I mean, wh how do people, how do Syrians on the ground now, the ones who took up arms originally to fight for their town, their village, their country, how do they see um, the presence of these foreign fighters or these radical elements? How, how are they relating to them? And um, you know, do, can we sort of, do we have any sort of sense of what the f their future is in, in Syria? Um, well, f first of all, I just want to say that uh, the foreign elements, the foreign fighters, um, weren't only with Shabbat al-Nusra or with the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem, they also fought with some groups that identified themselves as Free Syrian Army. So they've been there for, for a while. But with the, um, the fall of territory, Syrian territory around the Turkish border, with the fall of that, those areas to the opposition, then obviously that helped facilitate the entry of more foreign fighters into the country. It became easier for them to get in. Um, <coughs> The, me the men I know from, from the beginning, the ones who are still alive, of course, who first took up arms, many of them uh, are disillusioned. They're, they feel like they're caught between the regime on one side and the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem on the other. Um, some of them are sitting out this p period of the fight because they feel that it's quote unquote too dirty in the sense that these um, radical Islamist elements seem to be uh, uh, very dominant in some areas. Uh, so there's a real sense of disillusionment. The sense of abandonment, which was always there, has deepened. Uh, resentment for the, for the situation now, the, fa the feeling that nobody helped them. And that's why uh, northern Syria, in particular, is in the state that it's in. And so I mean, <laughs> one question that I sort of struggle with is, the issue of moral clarity in, in Syria. Um, I was traveling the other day and I overheard someone saying randomly, you know, I can't believe in Syria the, the, the extent to which people will go to fight each other. There's just these radical extremists that are, that are killing each other. And this is sort of the dominant narrative of, uh, through which people um, who don't know Syria well are concluding the situation. And so, you know, but that is not, that is not, that can't be the end of the story. And, and, and I'm wondering if you can help us sort of find the, that moral clarity in, in Syria in the context of such a, a chaotic situation. I mean, is it, is it with the civilians um, that are caught between the fighting forces? Is it, is it with the fighting forces, but certain types of fighting forces, the moderate elements? Um, is it just taking a, a stand against the regime? I mean, where, where is it that we can say we, we have moral clarity on, on what's right and what's wrong in Syria? Well, that's not for me to say. I'm, uh, I'll just tell you what I saw, but I won't tell you what's right or wrong. That's for you to make up your own minds. I'm just going to tell you what I saw. Maybe some examples or stories of moments when you sort of were compelled by the situation and um, well I mean you know as I complicated as it is 
Yeah, it's complicated. I'm, I'm a journalist. I'm just reporting what I see. I'm not, you know, taking sides. I don't, um, I'm not going to say what's right and what's wrong, but I can say that there are millions and millions of Syrian civilians who are suffering. Um, there are areas in Syria that have been without electricity for more than a year that have uh, water shortages. This in a country that is water rich, mainly because uh, with the electricity being cut off, it's harder to pump water out and a basic infrastructure like this. Uh, it's very, very difficult for, for a lot of people. Uh, inflation is rampant. Many have been out of work, obviously, for, uh, for, for years. Um, the randomness of shelling is, is terrifying. It is terrifying to, be, to, to, to feel so passive when you're just simply sitting in your home and, and you just don't know. It's sheer luck whether or not an uh, artillery or a rocket or something is going to land on your home. It's a terrifying uh, experience, and it's one that millions of Syrian families face every day. And, and the, this the artillery fire is coming from the, the regime. It's coming from the regime, yes. It's, it's you know, there are, there are war, war planes, there are helicopters that are disgorging barrel bombs, which are improvi improvised explosives devices that are um, full of uh, bits of metal and what have you, things like that. On the other side, of course, the rebels um, also have uh, weapons. They have anti-aircraft guns of various calibers. They're making their own. Uh, they're getting supplies smuggled in from neighboring countries. And there are, of course, certain governments that are backing uh, various elements. And, and so talk a little bit about your interaction with the civilians, I, you know, as a journalist that goes into Syria, um, as I understand the situation, you you can't go in unescorted. You 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 have to go in under armed I don't, I don't protection. Know. Well, I don't know about or armed. under the regime uh, with a regime visa, which means that you're then minded and yeah. Limited well, I can't I can't go in on a regime visa because I um I've been blacklisted since about. Three three months into the uh, uprising. So I, that, that area is sadly blocked to me, and I can't, uh, I can't report on that. I wish that I could. Um, it depends also who you are. You know, I um, look a certain way. I uh, speak the language, so I can obviously pass. And I, I travel alone in the sense that I don't use fixers, translators, security, anything like that. Um, and I can't do my work, basically, without the, the extreme generosity of Syrians who help me. They, um, they welcome me, you know, they, they open their homes to me, they open their bases, they help me get from A to B, and my work would not be possible without, without that uh, generosity. And I thank and acknowledge that very deeply. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, I think it depends on who you are. You know, as if, I, if I were blonde and male and six foot four, I think I'd have a very different experience of reporting in Syria than uh, I do. You know, I, I can um, physically blend in as much or as little as I want to, and that's a spectrum that I move across depending on where I am, who I'm with, security situation, any particular area. Um, and it differs from place to place. In some places, on my last trip in, for example, it was in late August, and uh, sadly, I've been out of Syria now for since then, which is my longest period ever outside of the country. And um, I went into those areas with Jabhat al-Nusra and some Salafi Ahrar al-Sham men because I felt that I needed that level of uh, protection, I guess is the word. But it's more a case of um, if I'm with them, then other groups will know, you know that, that, that I'm with them. Uh, I'm referring, of course, to the kidnapping of journalists and aid workers and what have you in Syria. It's an unprecedented in amount, according to the various uh, press watchdogs. Uh, I think the figure is 40-something in the span of two and a half years, which is an incredible figure if you think about it. Uh, many of those who are, who are picked up simply disappear. We don't hear who has them. There's no ransom demand or anything like that. So that's what I meant when I said that I'd, in certain areas, um, I would have to go in with somebody like that. And um, oddly enough, I, I, the, the Jabhat al-Nusra men who were there with me told me, listen, you know, if the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem comes for you, even we can't do anything for you. So that's just an indication of, of some of the um, 
uh, it's an indication of the interaction, actually, between these groups in some areas. It's a very complicated picture. And so you've been around the, the men, the scary men with beards. <laughs> scary is relative. <laughs> Um, but they, but there is a lot of uh, per the, the perception is uh, in the U.S. and in the West that that these are fighters that are um, that are enemies of of the free world, if you will. Um, but but I think you're telling a more complicated story that in part um, they're they're caught up in a game that you know is, is perhaps not one of their own making, but what what are the dimensions of these these different fighters and do they talk about wh what what and if Syria me still means something to them as a as a place as a country what what are they fighting for? Well, there are uh, you know I said before that Islamism is a spectrum, so there are a wide variety of views. Um, in the beginning, when we started seeing these uh, battalions, these katibas being formed, many of them adopted. Uh, names, is Islamic names, they were either names of uh, historical figures or important battles in Islamic history. Uh, they did that for a number of reasons. Some of them did it because they were trying to attract the, uh, the funding of donors in the Gulf, Gulf sheikhs, the guys with the, with the big pockets and the, the massive fundraising abilities. Others did it um, because they were true believers, because they um, were either, you know, they Salafi Islamists or, or other for types of Islamists. Um, there were others who also did it, almost like a, um, like a Sunni identifier, to to identify that to to mark them as, uh, as uh, Sunnis. Um, you know, in Arabic we say that everything that is forbidden is desired. So even something like uh, wearing a beard was an act of defiance against a regime that viewed an outward um, manifestation of religiosity, like a beard, as a, uh, as a sig sign, if you like, of be a potential Islamist and therefore a potential threat. So even having a beard was like an act of defiance, so you have to view it like that. But um, you know, as time went on, uh, people's attitudes changed. Um, I, I remember talking to a fighter in uh, Maharit Naman, which is a city in Idlib province, and I, th he, I think he put it to me, to me best. He said, listen, he was with the Salafi Ahrar al-Sham brigades at the time. He said, listen, we weren't always like this. I didn't have this, this Islamist ideology. But he said, with time, um, our feeling that the only person, the only thing that could get us out of this was God. You know, they, they used to chant, uh, God, you are the only one who is with us. And, and with time, they really came, many of them really came to believe that. And, um, you know, there's also the old saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. That also plays a part. Th these are people who are under constant uh, danger. It's a very dangerous environment. And, you know, in dangerous environments, people can often turn to religion. And they can, uh, you can see a growing religiosity. And uh, with time, that religiosity can become radicalized. And that is a uh, sentiment that can be reinforced, if you like, when, when the only assistance that these people got was the guys with the, uh, the long beards and the short pants. Other, other, other foreign fighters, other Islamists, and when they came in, so you know, it, it, that, that idea was also reinforced. Um, I was telling you earlier that I know, I know men who, uh, who uh, participated in protests initially. Uh, I know one guy who then went on to do uh, relief work. After a while, he felt that that wasn't getting him anywhere. He picked up a gun, and he's now with Jabhat al-Nusra. So, you know, this is, we're two and a half years into a conflict now that is very bloody. It's very ugly. There are few signs that anything is going to end it anytime soon. And people can, can, can get desperate, and they can turn to whatever form of support they feel they have in abundance, and often that is religion. And, and where do women fit in this story? Women have always been there. Women <coughs> are not absent from the Middle East in general, and the Syrian uprising in particular. Um, you know, I remember walking in protests, and there were women uh, there were women who were smuggling weapons past government checkpoints. There were women um, who were cooking for the uh, rebel fighters. There were women who simply remained in their homes and 
did not want to leave them, and that in itself was an act of defiance. They refused to leave their, their country. There, um, I met uh, a woman who was a fighter. Uh, you know, so, so wom women are there, and then they're not just, uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking now of, uh, on one of my trips I went to Raqqa City, which is the, uh, the only one of Syria's 14 provincial capitals to have fallen from the uh, regime's grip. And uh, that happened, I think it was in March of this year, it was earlier this year. And uh, it is now an ISIS stronghold. It is now a stronghold of the Islamic State of Iraq and Hisham. But there are still uh, women and men, but especially women, who are um, resisting the uh, ISIS in their city. I remember being there a couple of weeks after it fell, and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra at the time, there was no ISIS that hadn't declared itself yet, but Jabhat al-Nusra was handing out pamphlets about what they considered appropriate female attire. And it was extremely conservative. It wasn't even hijab and abay. It was, it was a, you know, they wanted the face covered and everything. And I remember ha handing this around to women, and they just tossed it aside and said, what is this? Who do they think they are if they think they're going to make us wear something like this? Um, there is a woman now in Raqqa City. Her name is Saad Nofal. And she protests every day in front of the uh, headquarters of the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham on her own. So, you know, don't, uh, don't discount the participation of uh, Syrian women in their uprising and Arab women in particular. And I'm just wondering, though, what are women, how do you access women if you're trying to tell a story and learn about a place and, and do your reporting? Is it as easy to, to speak to women as, as to men? Well, um, well, you know, the fact that I am a woman helps because um, many of these, um, Many of these uh, towns and villages are rather conservative, <coughs> so um, you know men often can't get into. They can't, you know, they're, they're, they're gender segregated. Many of the uh, in many of these places. So I mean, I can sit with the women, and I can also sit with the men. But uh, some male colleagues can't sit with the women. So you know, I and I speak the language, and so I, I have those advantages. So it's uh, and you know, and there are many people who are still in their homes, like I said. So I don't. It's not an issue for me. Um, and but have you done much of reporting on the on the civilian activists? Um, you, you talked about Iraqa, which was the first liberated provincial capital and the only one that where it's liberated meaning the regime is not present. Um, and I met some of the civilian, young civilian activists from Raqqa in Turkey. Um, and they were talking about how they had the dual fight against the ISIS and, and the regime. Um, having lived through great trauma in, in, the, in the course of their activism and the course of the two years of the uprising, um, and you know, I found to be them to be sort of a, a source of hope um, in, about Syria and for Syria because because their their struggle was one for for values, a certain set of values, as opposed to um, as opposed to taking up arms and, and fighting fighting what what may be a very long and hard battle to actually win. And I'm just wondering if you, how much coverage you've, you've done of these civilian activists, um, and where are they today in, in Syria? Yeah, I covered the civilian activists when, um, when they were the major force. Uh, unfortunately, it's neither now the time of the guys with the guns. The civilian activists are still there, however, and um, with regard to Raqqa in particular, uh, when I was there, it was, um, I remember going into the headquarters of where the, all the civilian activists were, and they were, you know, very excitedly coming up with logos for their, for their Raqqa Media Center and things like that, and exchanging ideas, and, and there was an energy about what they were doing. Many of those people now have uh, fled Raqqa city because of the Islamic State of Iraq and Hisham. They feel like they're caught between the regime and the Islamic State of Iraq and Hisham. When I speak to um, the few who uh, people who, who I know who are still there and who are still 
undertake this kind of work. Um, they won't speak to me, if I talk to them over Skype, they won't speak to me voice to voice if there are other people around there. They don't want people to know that uh, they're speaking to a female. Uh, one of them spoke to me in the masculine because of the uh, fear of like the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem, they will text me instead. Um, you know, some of them have invited me to, to come back and, you know, I think about it. But then others tell me, listen, you can't walk on the street with a man who isn't your relative now because of the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem. And this is a place where, where in earl earlier this year, I could walk uh, freely. Um, the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem obviously was not, uh, hadn't been formed yet, but uh, Jabhat al-Nusra was there. Jabhat al I saw, I saw Jabhat al-Nusra fighters protecting the city's two churches. Um, they had, uh, you know, people stationed all in all sorts of areas. They said uh, that looting was not permitted. They, uh, they and others, because there was there was an Islamist coalition. They, you know, there there was order. The bakeries were running, um, and you know, th I want to stress that they. I saw them protecting the churches. But when the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem came into Raqqa City, they. Uh, removed the crosses from the churches. I saw it on a snippet of video and I recognized the church. It was the um, Armenian church. It was near a public garden, not too far, short walk from the governor's house. I'd been there before. They removed the crosses from the church and they uh, put the black flags up. But later that same evening, a group of uh, young Syrian activists from Raqqa city went back under cover of darkness to the church and they carried the cross and they chanted the Syrian people are one. So even in a city like Raqqa, that, that is, they're the forces that are still present. So there are guys with guns, but do not discount, A, the moderation of Syrians, and B, the uh, desire to not replace one authoritarian system with another. Okay, one more question before I open it to the audience, and that's just about the perception of the role of the U.S. in Syria. Um, we've gone through ups and downs here. <laughs> debating for a long time what, what to do. Then, um, when chemical weapons were fired, suggesting that we may be ready to intervene militarily, which I think raised expectations on some side, maybe trepidation in other parts. And now we're sitting back and hoping that negotiations in Geneva will produce some sort of solution in this very complicated situation. What, what is the perception of the U.S. that you hear? Is, is there any understanding of the complications that the U.S., the, the people of the U.S. Would, would be thinking about in terms of intervention, the complications and thinking about forms of intervention? Or is it just anger? Well, um, what, to start with, the uh, um, Syrian population was not pro-American. It, was, uh, it really was on the same page as the regime. Unlike, say, um, many quarters in Iran where the people are pro-American, but the regime is anti-American. So that's the baseline that we're starting with. There was a resentment of the US for a number of uh, reasons, mainly its foreign policy in the Middle East with regard to Israel, the invasion of Iraq, and other things like that. So that's the baseline that you were starting with. Um, you know, certainly uh, many elements of the Syrian opposition looked and hoped that the US would uh, do something. They wanted something to stop this uh, this bloodbath. You know, we've got more than 120,000 people killed in the span of a couple of years. It's uh, it's you know it's a very bad situation for them. Um, there is uh, resentment. There is anger anger at the what the, what is perceived as inaction. There is a growing idea that uh, the U.S. really does want uh, Bashar al-Assad to stay. Um, there is confusion in some parts about what exactly uh, the U.S. wants, but mainly there's this idea that um, the U.S. wants Bashar al-Assad to stay, that it doesn't care about Syrian uh, lives, Syrian blood, that um, it, with the chemical weapons deal in particular, for example, it was like the death of however many people it was, horrendous, horrific, horrible as it was. It was a small um, percentage, a very small incident and much bigger conflict that has seen well over 100,000 people dead, and yet those were the deaths that counted more than any others. So, you know, there, there was, uh, there's a cynicism as well. And there is, um, 
just a sense of abandonment, not just from the U.S., but from from from, from the world, but particularly from from a U.S. that uh, talks about you know freedom and and uh, and uh, democracy and uh, and the value of human life, and that they think is sitting by and watching as their blood is shed in the streets. Okay. Um. So just to note for people who may have questions, Rania, I think you were also recently in Jordan and you live in Lebanon, so you can also comment on the situation the of the refugees yeah. as well. Okay, um, please go ahead. Um, can you identify yourself? Yes, my, my name is Edie Cutler. I've lived in Saudi Arabia and Tunisia. And, um, Did you, should I repeat? I'm Dee yes. Cutler. I've lived in Saudi Arabia and Tunisia. And uh, shortly before all the events happened in Syria, I was invited by the Syrian government as a photographer to photograph all over Syria. And that was when Syria was hot. It was everybody wanted to go. And uh, so uh, I went. And I would just be very interested now how the, the, the daily life is. Uh, the boutique hotels which were flourishing, are they still going? And the damage, I've gone online uh, to see the damage in the souks and the Croc de Chevalier. Could you give a little update as to the daily life and the damage to the historical monuments? Well, I um, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I wish I could give you an update about Damascus, but I haven't been able to go there for, for a long time. And um, that's a great regret. I wish that I could. Uh, so I can't speak about the, the suit in Damascus. I haven't seen it. If I haven't seen it, I can't uh, tell you about it. But I can tell you about the situation in the north. I mean, the, the, the level of devastation is incredible in cities like Aleppo and in many uh, small towns and villages. These are, there. there is, in some areas, there is no building that is unscathed. Many are, are shorn open. It's like they're just sliced, sliced open. The uh, you know rubble pours out into the streets. There are some areas where uh, there's ankle-high rubble, and they just remove it enough so that cars can pass. There are um, you know electricity blackouts, like I said. Uh, th there there are some groups that are providing electricity, and they tend to be more Islamist militias as well that are trying to, to provide basic services. Um, el electricity uh, shortages, water shortages. Um, many uh, farmers haven't been able to plant their crops, especially in, you know, it's a very rich, Syria is a very rich agricultural uh, country. Many uh, farmers haven't been able to plant their crops. Rampant inflation in the markets. Um, there are people who, uh, who th there's a lot of internal displacement. There are people who have, um, you know, there are families now that have taken in extended families, that are taking in other families. It's a really, really dire situation for, uh, for civilians. There are many, many millions of children who haven't been to school for years as well. Um, uh, of course, the uh, vaccination issue is a, is a big thing because in, uh, in areas that have fallen out of government control, there is no uh, vaccination. People can't uh, vaccinate their children in these uh, places because a lot of these international aid organizations only deal with governments. Of course, in these areas, there is no government. Hence, there are problems with, uh, with things like that. Uh, with hospitals, there are a lot of, uh, in rebel held areas, a lot of the hospitals have been hit. People have to rely on field clinics, which are often um, insufficiently supplied. I have seen children being operated on without anesthetic in lots of places. So it's, you know, it's a, it's, we're talking massive. really massive changes to a country that was, um, that used to uh, export its agricultural produce around the region to a country that uh, is water rich, to a country that is rich in so many different ways. And, and you, you see the complete uh, destruction of, uh, of, of these areas and the, the, the lives and the livelihoods as well. You know just about the boutique hotels in Aleppo, I'm thinking. Oh, Aleppo is, uh, I mean, the salt has, has been hit. Uh, there have been fires. There are, it's uh, the looting as well. Lots of things have been looted. It's a, it's a very dire situation. Yes, please, up front here. Um, a little more, perhaps, can, about. Can you just say, identify? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Marianne Stein. I'm with the Mariah Fund. Um, 
you said that the international aid agencies cannot work in um, in the non government they have to work with the government so there That's my are understanding. any of them um, reaching into the areas that are rebel help <coughs> But uh, I, I did see some reports that, um, that there were attempts to get some vaccinations down in Deir Ezzor in the east, but I can't, uh, you know, I'd have to check that. So I had understood that some um, local aid agencies were getting supplies and assistance um, somehow from outside, and I just wondered if you knew anything well, about that. Well, I mean, that. there are there are Syrian NGOs, of course, that are trying to uh, to fundraise and to get assistance and to do what they can, but the need is absolutely massive. I mean, we're talking about more than uh, six million people who are either refugees or internally displaced. This is not something that a local Syrian NGO can deal with. This is a, a huge, I think the UN said that it was one of the biggest, uh, uh, is the, biggest the biggest, biggest, if not the, 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 the biggest one. So. Well, Worst humanitarian disaster in the yeah. modern era. But, but, but just to, to sort of um, qu take that line of questioning just a bit further, um, I mean, have you witnessed aid deliveries, the food baskets, the blankets? Um, the, <laughs> the, only, the only deliveries I have seen are, uh, are deliveries that were literally carried on the backs of Syrians who, who carried them into their own country. I haven't seen anybody else assisting them. Okay, I'm going to take some questions back here. The woman in the red. Sana, um, uh, Syrian Nation Coalition. Um, actually, like I came recently from Syria, like five months ago, and I wasn't in the north side. I was like in Damascus and like regime sides area. So, like when you're talking about the north side and you're talking about the Islamic groups and like uh, civil activists. Um, I miss the part about um, Hezbollah fighters and Iran's fighters. Like they are really exist in the north, and like they are really part of this war in the north. So I would like to know what did you see about th from them? Mm. I haven't seen any Hezbollah fighters, but of course, uh, you know the, the foreign fighters are on both sides. The, uh, the they're assisting the rebels, but we also have uh, Hezbollah very openly fighting with the regime. We also have uh, reports about Iranians, about Iraqi Shias about uh, others as well who are fighting for the regime. So, I mean, you know, Syria is a proxy battle. It's a proxy war. And it is drawing in foreigners from uh, all different areas on both sides, definitely. Uh, in the back. Hi, I'm Mark Seibel with McClatchy Newspapers. Um, I'm curious about the comment when you were with the Nusra escorts with they said, you know, if ISIS shows up, we really can't protect you. What were they telling you? Why was that? And then, then let me ask another question, which is um, uh, regarding ISIS. Um, there's a theory, I'm sure you've heard it, that ISIS is really working with the regime and doing the regime's work. Um, I wonder what you think about that, uh, and I wonder if you have any insight into why ISIS uh, aggressively moved against the FSA in a place like Assaz? Um, okay, so in uh, April of this year, the uh, leader of the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, uh, sorry, the Islamic State of Iraq, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, who's an Iraqi, uh, announced that his organization was the parent organization of Jabhat al-Nusra, and he said that uh, the two would merge and that they would form the Islamic State of Iraq and Sham. A few days later, the leader of al-Nusra, Abu Muhammad al-Julani, who is a Syrian, rejected this. He said, we weren't, listen, we, we didn't know about this uh, declaration before it was made. Uh, we reject it, and we will remain Jabhat al-Nusra. Uh, Al-Qaeda Central, if you like, the leader of Al-Qaeda Central, Ayman al-Zawahri, weighed in, and he said that the two groups should remain separate. His ruling was ignored by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So when this uh, happened in <coughs> April, uh, I, I know guys in Jabhat al-Nusra who didn't know which way to go. They started saying, do we go with Baghdadi, do we go with uh, Jolani? Many of the hardcore foreign elements went with ISIS. So by default, Jabhat al-Nusra became more Syrian. Um, there have been differences. You know, Jabhat al-Nusra was always careful not to antagonize the communities in which it uh, based itself. It seemed to have learned the lessons of Iraq, and it didn't want to, it, you know, they would suggest the hijab, for example. They would suggest certain uh, means to dress, especially for women, but they wouldn't impose it. 
ISIS is a very different creature. They uh, very aggressively antagonize the uh, local populations, both the, the military uh, units that are present, including Jabhat al-Nusra in some areas, as well as civilians. Um, they are basically the Islamic State of Iraq, and they're doing everything that that group did in, in Iraq. Um, so in some areas, like in Raqqa, for example, the uh, Islamic State of Iraq uh, and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, the animosity is such that the Islamic State kidnapped the emir of Jabhat al-Nusra in that city. So, I mean, you know, the, the, that's, that's the level of animosity in some areas. Of course, that differs in other areas. They work together quite happily. So it's a very localized thing. That's the other thing about the Syrian war is that, you know, I'm, I'm loath to sort of generalize about it because I don't think that you can. It's very localized. The dynamics uh, are very different in different areas. And that's something that we also uh, have to uh, keep in mind. And I can't remember if I answered all your questions or if there was something else. Describing a relationship with ISIS that didn't permit them to respond should they attempt to kidnap no, you? No, that was very particular. I was in uh, the countryside of uh, Lad'iyya, Latakia, and um, I have never seen that many foreign fighters there, and I've been in just about everywhere except for a couple of places. Um, they were really drawn to, to that battle. I saw units that were comprised solely of Chechens, um, there were men from many, many different places. So that was a very particular kind of dynamic in that, in that area. So in that area, those Jabhat al-Nusra guys had that relationship with the elements of ISIS. It's very particular. It depends. Now, now this was in the last time you were in Syria, right, in yeah. August. And uh, you're saying that that was particular to Latakia. Uh, are we sure it's not something similar in, in other areas? Areas. No, I mean, it is like in Raqqa, it's the same sort of thing in some parts of Aleppo. It's a, um, so it depends, it really does depend on, on where you are. So I, I, I won't generalize and say this is the situation everywhere because it's not the case. Not to monopolize, but what about ISIS doing the work of the regime? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, you know, when Jabhat al Nusra was first formed, the same, the, the same allegations were made that Jabhat al Nusra is part of the, the regime. Uh, or it's part of regime propaganda, or it plays into regime propaganda, and certainly the same claims have been made of ISIS. And uh, you know, this is something that comes up. This has come up before. Uh, I will tell you that uh, in Raqqa, for example, everybody knows where the ISIS headquarters are. Quite clear, they're in the the governorate, and they're in the former governor's mansion. Uh, oddly enough, those two places haven't been hit in all the airstrikes on the city. Okay, I think Ryan, did you have a question? Right here up front. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk more about the structure of ISIS, how um, both in terms of where precisely the money comes from and how it's determined, like which areas will get that money and if they're sort of fighting between those regional groups. And also the structure in terms of how they conduct local governance and how the decisions are made. Is it uh, in different places, Syrians that are making the decision that um, they'll provide electricity or force women to wear niqab, or is it foreign elements that are making the, their, those decisions, um, and does that differ across regions? I can't speak to where ISIS gets its money from, I don't know, but I know that uh, when Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi made his statement about uh, the formation of the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem, he said that uh, um, almost half of Jabhat al-Nusra's money was coming from the Islamic State of Iraq. So that, that much is known. Um, in terms of the foreigners, there are also Syrians within uh, the Islamic State of Iraq and Hashem. Uh, so it's not just a foreign thing. Uh, you know, and, it, and it differs in different areas. In some places they have um, foreign emirs, and in other places they have Syrian emirs. So it's a very, uh, you know, it differs. Um, when, uh, when a lot of these places fell out of uh, regime control, obviously, other forms of um, uh, order needed to sort of be imposed in many cases. So in many areas, we started to see uh, Sharia courts come to the fore simply because you know this was a, a means to try and impose some form of uh, order and to settle disputes and what have you. Um, after a time, we saw them in some of these areas. They started to form Hayat uh, Sharia, um, legislative uh, association, if you like, and this uh, was comprised of. Um, representatives from the different uh, military units as well as civilians. And often they were elected to this kind of a board. 
um, in, in many of the cities and the towns. So they would be elected to this sort of Hayat Shara'iyya, which would um, be responsible for trying to secure some of these uh, services, for example. They'd try and uh, negotiate this kind of stuff. Uh, in many places, ISIS sort of just took over now in the past six months and just took over and imposed its own views. Uh, with regard to the present, to the um, services, for example, particular brigades or battalions of, or military units, whatever you want to call them, um, would take it upon themselves to provide uh, electricity via generators to certain areas. So it really does depend on, on the aerial. Okay. Um, Adnan, in the back here. <coughs> Adnan Zulfikar, I'm, uh, from the Truman National Security Project. Uh, I had a question about there. Uh, you talked about geographic identity. Some some groups coalescing around that, and then ideological as well. There have been some people who've uh, <coughs> thrown out this suggestion that uh, sort of tribal uh, affiliations uh, may be a route similar to in Iraq to create sort of a, another force that may you know, challenge ISIS and, and some of these other groups. To what extent have you found people coalescing around tribal identity uh, in your travels? Uh, I, th I, wrote I wrote a story about this um, earlier this year. Um, the, ba the Ba'ath system sort of broke the tribal structure. It broke the uh, traditional pyramidal tribal structure with the, uh, with the sheikh, the at the at the apex, because it was a uh, alternative source of power, it was a potential threat. So they sort of broke that uh, traditional um, structure, unlike in Iraq, for example. And they would um, pick other sheikhs, other other leaders who didn't have much um, clout in terms of the traditional tribal hierarchy, but who could get things done with the regime, with the system. So their clout this increased. This is pre-revolution. Yeah, this is pre pre. So their clout sort of increased because they were the guys who could get things done with the regime, um, leaving the traditional uh, tribal leaders sort of sidelined. Um, in some areas, we're talking about the East mainly because that tends to be, uh, you know, th there is some talk about, uh, about reconstituting, if you like, this traditional tribal, the, the traditional power of the tribal uh, leader. Um, it remains to be seen whether or not the, the Sahawat will come from the tribes or whether they'll simply come from uh, from uh, FSA groups and others who are angry at uh, what ISIS is doing in their country. So it doesn't necessarily have to come from tribes because the, the structure of, I mean, you know, we're talking about a regime, uh, a system of governance that over 40 years changed the structure of the tribes and, and the power dynamics within it. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to come from, from, from that, replicate the Iraqi model. But are the people falling back into old patterns, or we're just seeing new leaders emerging? Well, you know, that's that's a sad thing about um, civil wars, is that especially ones that take on increasingly sectarian hue, is that people are sort of being driven into their base identity. People are being identified as uh, Sunni or Alawi or from this clan or from whatever. And tribal affiliation can often mean uh, the difference between whether or not you can freely enter an area, whether you can pass a checkpoint, things like that. So, you know, people are sort of retreating into this identity and they're also being forced back into it at the same time. Okay, um, back here. Um, hi, my name is Tanvi. I'm uh, from the Middle School of Journalism. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the refugees. Uh, we know there's a crisis, you know, in um, neighboring nations in uh, Jordan and Lebanon, and they're kind of um, buckling under the, you know, just the burden of that. But also, um, Iraqi nationals who are it stuck in Syria at the moment, or you know, people from other countries who. Um, we're kind of stuck in the midst of this um, proxy war, really, and have no means of getting out. And so, uh, if you could just, if you'd seen something, or if you've, um, you know, know anything about that, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the, the situation for Syria, for uh, Syrian refugees in neighboring countries is, uh, it's very different in different countries. In, in Turkey, for example, the government-run camps, and you know, they were established very early on in the summer of uh, 2011 when we started to see the first. Um, camps in Turkey. In uh, Lebanon, of course, the country doesn't allow official uh, refugee camps. There's some talk that now they're, they're allowing some to be formed, but uh, for a number of reasons, mainly to 
the historical, uh, you know, Lebanon's history with refugees, starting with the Palestinians. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a political football. It's a very touchy issue, the issue of setting up camps for refugees. But having said that, you know, more than there, there are more than a million Syrians, not all of them refugees, in a country of about four million people. So, and they're entering a society that has long been polarized over the issue of Syria. There have long been Lebanese who are pro-Assad, and there have long been uh, Lebanese who are anti-Assad. And into this sort of, and, and they have their own issues. So into this kind of volatile mix, you can add a million Syrians who are coming with their own traumas and their own um, experience of war. So that's a very, very delicate uh, situation. In Jordan as well, I think the number is, uh, I don't know, 700, 800,000 people. And there, there, there are camps for um, Syria, and there is, of course, the famous Zatar camp, but only about 100,000 people are there. Most of the um, Syrians are finding uh, homes in the urban centers. They're, they're everywhere, you know, and resentment is growing as well towards the Syrian population that is perceived as, you know, taking uh, jobs away from Jordanians and also putting a huge stress on a country that is very water poor, uh, which is a, a very big deal and which is, you know, has its own economic issues uh, that it's trying to deal with. So, you know, the, the, and in Iraq, of course, we saw um, this summer a massive influx of uh, Syrians who basically walked into Iraq. So, you know, each country has its own, um, has its own challenges with regard to the uh, Syrian population. In addition to the Iraqis, who you mentioned, who are uh, who were living in uh, Syria. We also have the Palestinians, who have become, many of them have become refugees, uh, either a second or a third time now in neighboring states. And they have a, they have a particular, you know, issue as well. So you were just in Jordan. Uh, what, what is the situation um, with, with Syrians? We, we've heard a lot about the hospitality of Jordan. We've also heard recently that the, there may be some border closure, closures. Is it, is it a free flow for refugees? Is it, I mean, what, what's the status of the situation? Is, is uh, Jordan stretched too far? Well, Jordan is definitely stretched. And um, you know, my understanding is that there are tens of thousands of Syrians now are stranded on the Syrian side of the Jordanian border uh, waiting to get in. Uh, the uh, Jordanians have built a bigger camp. It's bigger than uh, Zaatari. And um, you know that they're hoping that they can get on the on the Syrian side uh, of the border. No, it's on the Jordanian side of the border, and it's much bigger than Zatir. So I mean, you know, nobody thinks that these people are going to go home anytime soon. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like your reaction on, or your your comment on where we sh where we the U.S. and its. Uh, and the Western community should be going from, you know, uh, from this point. Um, it's clear that the opposition is highly fragmented. Uh, I suspect that that is a result in part of an ideology, but also in a part uh, also because, you know, our reticence to provide support, you know, has led some to gravitate towards more extreme el elements, which in fact were gaining support. And that as a result, you know, trying to, at, at, at this point, trying to visualize an opposition, you know, um, which is strong enough um, to negotiate an, an a, a final outcome, which is in, in, in some way an improvement over the pre-war situation, may not be realistic. At this point, therefore, you know, should we be essentially trying to do that, or should we basically say, well, there's very little we can do, you know, to influence the final outcome and should be focusing our attention more just on the, uh, the huge humanitarian crisis, both within Syria and, and in neighboring countries, which, the, uh, um, you know, which, which, has, which has taken place in the, last, in the last couple of years. Well, once again, I'm not, it's not my job to say what you should or should not do. But, um, you know, I will say that uh, a lot of people you know, looked at Syria and they thought, oh, it's very complicated, it's uh, too hard, what are we going to do? Well, the thing is, is that it's not going to get any easier. So if it was too hard two years ago and you weren't sure who to, who to pick, you know, it's not going to get any easier. It's only going to get more complicated. So you, you haven't been inside Syria for a few months, but you've been to the camps in Jordan, you, you're living in Lebanon, you're talking to Syrians who are inside. 
Are people say, saying what they want to happen? I mean, are they, what attitudes are they expressing towards the, the war nowadays? What are they saying about the prospect of negotiations in Geneva next month? I mean, what, what are, I mean, what's, know, what are you hear being, what's? Well, m many people are just um, sick and tired. They're just tired. They're, you know, this is a, an incredibly brutal conflict. There are more than 120,000 people who have been killed. There are cities that have been leveled. There are, you know, children know the difference between a sniper's bullet and other forms of, of, uh, of weaponry. This is what has happened to Syria. A lot of people just want to, to get on with their lives. They want to be able to send their children to school. They just want some semblance of peace. You know, so whether that comes through negotiations or whether it comes through something else, there are, there are a lot of Syrians who simply, uh, you know, they've, they've, they're, they're traumatized, they've lost family members. Um, it's a very, it's a really, really dire situation. I mean, I don't know if I can describe just how difficult it is to live in some of these places. It's, um, they just want th the basics. They just want uh, to be able to stand in line at a bakery and, and know that they're not going to be hit by a warplane. They just want, uh, you know, th the things that everybody here wants. Yeah, here. Hi, my name is Julie Bloom. I'm just a person who's interested. <laughs> I spent some time in the Middle East helping journalists do things, and now I'm a psychotherapist. I work across the street. I follow things very closely. And I want to ask you if you and I were having coffee, like not your job, right? Um, what in your opinion, which is better informed than most, is the best possible way that things could go if you could wave a magic wand on the ground now, in your opinion, what, what could be done by anyone, whoever, whatever? Secondly, as a therapist, I'm just curious, in refugee camps around the Middle East where people are, is there treatment for people that are obviously suffering from PTSD? It, are people treating people's mental health at all, as far as you know? Um, and finally, if someone wanted in the United States to organize to, uh, as citizens here, not the government, to help a particular group inside Syria, such as Jabhat al-Nusra, would that be possible? If so, how do you know? You know, there, there are um, aid organizations that are trying to, um, to assist, especially the children. Um, Some of which are in the audience, so <laughs> I see CARE is present and, and TILAF. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely organizations and they try through various therapies. Um, you know, I've seen uh, kids who are receiving like painting therapy where they try and just paint their feelings and things like this. So there are groups that are, that are focusing specifically on this area of the, the trauma that many, many Syrians have experienced. Um, m waving a magic wand, I'd just say, you know, if you want to help, help the people. Just help, help the people. The UN says that it's very short, uh, the, the pledges of uh, assistance for the uh, Syrian appeal. You know, money still hasn't come in. They, they need money, they need help. Uh, you know, regardless of the politics, whether you're on one side or the other, the, there are people in the middle who are, who are suffering, and you know, the priority, I think, always has to be them. you know which aid organizations are the most getting to the people? I why don't I suggest that we have a, a side conversation after the meeting, because there are people present that are doing aid work. Um, we have a question here. Good morning. Thank you very much, Rani, for your work. Um, my name is Sijma Damasino. I work for the Embassy of Brazil, and I was posted to Syria between 2009 and 2012, so I couldn't relate to your testimony. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the role of the Kurdish movements, if you had a chance to witness uh, their uh, um, role in northern Syria. I haven't done much reporting from the Kurdish areas because um, I, li I don't speak Kurdish, and I like to be in a place where I can understand everything that's happening, especially because I go in by myself, so that's for my own security. I need to know, you know what's happening. Um, but you know, even, the, even the Kurds are, are split. There are so many different factions. There is a faction, for example, of the Kurdish um, Syrian opposition that is uh, just joined this Islamic Front, 
which is uh, not FSA, not Free Syrian Army, not an Al-Qaeda affiliate, it's a separate sort of entity. There are some who have called for uh, autonomy in the Kurdish areas, and there are others still who are believed to still be with the regime. So it's a very fragmented picture in the uh, Kurdish areas, but I can't really say more than that because I haven't, I haven't physically been there and I won't comment on something I haven't seen. I'm going to take one question in the back and then ask you the last one and close it. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Uh, it's been a great presentation. Chris Looney, CSIS. I was hoping to go back to Raqqa and, and when ISIS took over in May, May Raqqa? Yes, Raqqa, yeah. Okay. When ISIS took over on May 14th, um, was it May? Yeah. <laughs> you saw the decimation of a, of a lot of rebel groups that had been instrumental in taking the city in the first place, most particularly Afad al Rasul, which yeah. was um, its leadership was taken out by a car bomb. Um, but there are groups, especially Jabhat al Nusra and Ra al Sham, that still have a presence in the city. Um, some reporting has said that Ra al Sham has, um, has a role in, in the administration of the city and the. Ever and, um, holding up everyday life. And I was just wondering if you could comment on those two groups and, and what they're actually doing in Raqqa, because they are there. They don't have much strength because of ISIS, but they definitely still are there. So what is their relationship with ISIS, and what are they doing independently? And then also um, maybe close, I was hoping you would close possibly with just talking about the Islamic Front and, and how that is going to change the tra trajectory of the conflict. Thank you. When, uh, when Raqqa first fell, it was led by an Islamist coalition of about six groups, and it was spearheaded by uh, both Jabhat al-Nusra and Ahrar al-Sham. It was a particular unit of Ahrar al-Sham called uh, Umana al-Raqqa, and they were, they were the group that were uh, involved. And um, I remember meeting the, their leader uh, a couple of weeks after it fell, and um, you know, he was very proud of the fact that he had men outside the wheat silos who were protecting it, and that they were trying to um, organize the the day-to-day the -day running of the city, and they did do that, um, you know, so that they were they were doing that. That man has now gone missing, uh, believed to be abducted by ISIS. His fate is unknown, and uh, the Jabhat al-Nusra Emir has also been picked up by ISIS because he refused to pledge uh, allegiance to them. So that might give you an idea of the kind of relationship that those two groups now have with uh, with ISIS in the city. No, they're, they're, you know, I, 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 I don't think so because, you know, when I talk to, uh, to guys who I still know who are in Jabhat al-Nusra, they're still very, uh, very wary of this group. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge deal. They picked up the emir. That's uh, not something that you, uh, that you do without, that doesn't have very serious consequences. And that's also an indication of just how powerful they are in the city. Uh, and the Islamic Front, the, um, earlier this month, uh, so let me go back. So I was talking about the battalions, how we, we saw the formation of battalions with time. They started to coalesce and organize into uh, brigades. They called them brigades. And then um, in, I think it was uh, the summer of last year, we started to see the formation of coalitions, multi-brigade units. And some of these brigades were present nationwide. They had units everywhere. But we saw big coalition groups. One of them was the uh, Syrian Liberation Front. The other one was the Syrian Islamic Liberation Front. And um, some of them, like the Syrian Islamic Liberation Front, which was largely outside of the FSA, other, the other one had groups that were inside the FSA. Earlier this month, we saw the basic dissolution of these two groups and the formation of a new one called the Islamic Front, which uh, consists of some of the strongest um, groups on the ground inside Syria, and they're um, all outside of the FSA. So this is a uh, new development. They're saying that it's not merely an alliance, that it's a real sort of <coughs> merger, that it's not, um, and, th and that it's a complete sort of program, that it's going to be uh, military, political, and social as well. So it's in the early days of this yet, and we'll wait and see what, what comes of it on the ground. So, so sort of following up on that, my, my question for you would be, um, you know, part of what we're seeing, I think, all over the, the region is, you're, ha you're having uprisings where there hasn't been a history of activism or, or organization, and, and so there's a leadership vacuum um, amongst the opposition. And, um, and I know the Syrian opposition has been faulted for its fragmentation and so forth. And, but I'm wondering in the, on the ground and amongst fighters in particular whether or not you've seen any, um, any, any potential leadership emerge um, 
and what the profile of that leadership may be? Well, that's a <coughs> very broad question. But um, you know, I, I want to say that on, on the ground, um, there, there is coordination. You may not have this massive command and control that's coming from you know, FSA leadership, but there was always coordination on a local level, either um, in a particular area, in a town or a city or something like that, or ahead of a particular battle, uh, you know, that they would, they would coordinate to take out a particular airport, for example, or something like that. So you did see this um, local level coordination and sometimes that would be more, um, uh, sometimes it would even be pr province-wide. And within a group like Ahrar al-Sham, for example, there is organization, they're disciplined, and, and that's a nationwide group. So, you know, it depends on, on the particular area. I would say that, um, you know, you talk about the, the, the leadership opposition and certainly many uh, people have faulted it for that, but many in the opposition would also say, listen, you know, this is a country that didn't have any form of civil society for more than four for decades, and uh, you know, so they sort of had to learn how to how to be activists, how to how to how to establish themselves as civil society movements. And uh, many in the opposition will also say, well, you know, people say we're not united. Is the West united on Syria? Is Europe united on Syria? Is the international community united on Syria? And they would sort of throw that back on on the world, basically. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rania, for chatting with us. It's been thank very you. enlightening. Thank, thank you. you.